This video is going to be about the difference between an API and an SDK. A lot of folks get confused on this topic, especially because they are kind of related. So I wanted to make a video just to describe to you what each of these things are, how they are related to one another, and why they are both important. So in terms of the agenda for this video, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things. So the first topic is what is an API? So I wanted to have a section on both of these areas to clarify how the term API can be used in very different contexts. From there, we're going to talk about what is an SDK. And then finally, I'm going to bring it all together and just summarize all the information that I presented to you. So let's start this off by talking about what is an API from the classic computing definition. And so an API stands for Application Programming Interface. And it essentially deals with how software components can speak to one another. So for instance, if I'm writing an application and I want to use a particular part of the Windows operating system, I don't magically know how to do that. I need to go look at the Windows documentation to understand which class I need to use, which function I need to call, what the input is of that API, what the output is, and how all that stuff works. Well, this is an API in the classic computing definition. We as programmers interact with APIs all the time in order to do things using our programming language of choice. And so this is where the contract of the API comes in. And this is demonstrated through classes and functions like I was kind of describing before. So if we take a very real example, um, this Windows example where you want to use something from their operating system, let's take a look at what an actual API really looks like. So this is a web page from the Windows API, and this is for interacting with the Windows operating system. So we can see here that it's exposing a macro called create dialog A. And what this thing actually does if you've never heard of this function or class before is that it just opens a dialog box within the Windows operating system and you can see here they give you a example of what the input is it takes in a whole bunch of different arguments here and you know th this is a screenshot so you don't get to see the rest of it but note here on the right that it also tells you what the return value is it also tells you what this API does things that you should know about it and also any other requirements that you need to know about if you are going to be using this API now I think this is where a lot of people get confused because this is a very valid definition of what an API is. It's exposed in this case by the Windows operating system. But when a lot of people tend to think about APIs, they tend to think of the second definition, which is in terms of cloud computing. And that's what I'm going to get into in a moment. So let's talk about that now. So what is an API from the cloud computing perspective? Well, from the cloud computing perspective, an API is more concerned with data exchange from the client and server. So the client is the one that's requesting the information. The server is the one that has access to that information. It may not have that information stored locally. It may just know how and where to get it. That is the main role of the server in this relationship. And there's different specifications of how this, this whole dance exists. How do you get information from a server that has this stuff over the internet? So there's a couple different implementations of this. Um, the most popular one formed, I think, in 1999 or so was SOAP. More common these days, though, is REST, which is pretty much everywhere. Any company that exposes an API is probably going to give you a RESTful endpoint where you can access their resources. But more recently, there's a real big takeoff with GraphQL, which is an alternative way to access the same information. Now, one important point that I want to make here is that SOAP, REST, and GraphQL all contain and expose APIs to their clients in order to expose information, but they just do it in a slightly different way. So this is where the different specifications are opinionated in how information should be requested and how that information will be returned back to the client. Now let's take a look at this from the REST and GraphQL perspective, because out in the wild, this is probably what you're going to find. These are the most relevant ones today. So from the REST perspective, developers on the back end define resources. And this is what an endpoint for a resource may look like. So you're defining a user's resource and you're trying to find the user with ID number three. And you can also have more specific resources that you're interested in with regards to this particular user. In this specific example, we are interested in user ID number three and the comments that they have associated with them. So this is what a RESTful endpoint would look like using the very classic definition of what a REST API is. And there's also a variation on REST APIs. 
um, which is called RPC, which stands for Remote Procedure Call. And it's essentially a different variant of REST API. So you're not working with uh, resources in this kind of classical sense where you have this kind of special syntax and this special notation. It's more flexible and less cryptic in terms of the syntax. So you may have an RPC API that says like get comments. And within the get comments API, it takes a user ID as an input and a whole bunch of different things and returns a certain output. These are two different variants using REST on how to perform the same thing. The one that we're seeing in front of us here is the very opinionated classic definition of a REST API. And the other one that I just described is the RPC variant. Um, so in the classic REST API, there's four different verbs that you usually use. There's get, put, post and delete. So if you call this API here using this particular endpoint with a get verb, this would just get you the information for this particular user. It would get you the user's comments. If you call this same API with put or post, then that means you're attempting to create a new comment or update the content of a comment. And if you're doing the same thing with a delete verb, then that means you're trying to delete all the comments. Pretty straightforward. Now this has worked for a long time, but part of the reason why we're, we're starting to move to a different solution such as GraphQL is because this model is very inflexible. It's very strict. So if you imagine a world where, you know, you want to add a new use case to your application, maybe it's a website and it's communicating with a server that has access to a database. Well, if you want to add a new feature to your front end application, if there's no existing REST API that provides that data for you, a new one needs to be built. So you need to kind of interact with the backend developer. The backend developer needs to create a new API that needs to connect to a database. They need to expose that API to the front end. And then the front end needs to read off that API in order to get its data. This is a very big problem in terms of speed of development, which is why the industry seems to be a fan of GraphQL, which greatly simplifies this problem. So GraphQL uses a slightly different model. Again, it's all in the domain of exchanging information with the resource server, but it just accomplishes it in a slightly different way. So GraphQL is more entity driven and flexible. So it doesn't suffer the same problems that REST APIs face because GraphQL APIs just expose an entity and the types of operations that are allowed to be performed on that entity and puts a lot more power into the hands of the front end application. So a lot more business logic can exist there and it's really hands off from the back end developer perspective. So this is great because it gives the front end a lot more flexibility, allows you to develop features more quickly, but it also has some security and scale concerns, which are a topic for a different video. Um, so GraphQLs don't have this concept of resources like we saw over here. They have a concept called types and types are kind of a one-to-one -one mapping of your entities. So in this example, um, kind of what we were saying here, we had a concept of users and comments. We may create an entity called user and the user can have comments that are associated with them. That's what a GraphQL entity would look like. And from there, we can define queries on these users. And the queries essentially define how you can retrieve information. Mutations define how you can create or update information. And the great thing about GraphQL is that it provides a third concept called subscriptions. Um, so if you're coming from, you know, your vanilla REST APIs, this is kind of synonymous with WebSockets. So GraphQL uses a subscription model where a user can subscribe to a particular entity or a particular thing that they are interested in and get live updates from the backend server as events change on the backend. So it's a very, very powerful concept that is provided as part of GraphQL. So the definition that I've put forth for you in terms of cloud computing is probably what most people mean when they say APIs. It's mostly with respect to how clients are getting information from a server, how that information is going to be requested by the server and given back to the client. Uh, so that's generally what you should think about when you hear the term API. So what does SDK have to do with this, right? We, we talked about APIs, how information is exchanged from clients and servers and how it can be exchanged from different software components. So where does the term SDK come in here? Well, SDK, it turns out, is very closely related. It stands for Software Development Kit. And a Software Development Kit is essentially a grouping of tools 
um, to use a different product or service. So for instance, if I want to kind of use the Windows operating system, I would download the Windows operating system SDK. And with that, it probably would contain an IDE, probably something like Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio. It would contain probably a C++ or a C Sharp compiler. It would contain all sorts of documentation of all the different APIs that it exposes, what they all do, what the inputs are, what the outputs are, and how to basically do things with the Windows operating system. Conversely, I mean, the same thing applies for if you're using an API in the sense of a cloud definition. You know, you're not gonna get an IDE in this case, but you will get documentation that suggests how to use this API. All that is gonna be there for you. You may also get helper classes and helper functions that make it easier to call different APIs over the internet. And we're gonna see that in an example here in a moment. Um, so an important thing to note here, probably the most important thing um, is this third point here, which is SDKs can contain utility classes to call an API. So take a second to try and wrap your head around that. An SDK contains classes to call an API. An API does not contain anything regarding the SDK, but the SDK contains things that help you to call an API. So let's take a look at a very concrete example here of me trying to call an AWS DynamoDB database, right? So say I have this table that exists uh, in AWS DynamoDB and I wanna call it. How do I actually do that? Well, the first thing I need to do is that I need to download the AWS SDK. I need to go to the AWS website or use something like NPM or Maven or what, depending on your language of choice to download that SDK so I can actually call methods, which in turn will call DynamoDB. So I download that SDK, I add that to my project. So once I have that SDK installed, I need to find the method and the class that exposes how I can get information from my table that exists in DynamoDB. So here is what it looks like uh, if you're trying to use the get item API. So in this code, what are we looking at? We're storing response and we're using the DynamoDB client and we're calling the get item function on this DynamoDB client. And we're specifying some input arguments. We're saying this is our table name and this is the key and the value that we wanna get. We're trying to get an artist that is named Arturis, whatever this is. And then we're also trying to get the record where the song is this value here. So this is an SDK, right? This is you using an SDK. And when you use this SDK to call this function, you are in turn going to be making a REST API to the DynamoDB endpoint where it will receive your request and return things back to you. So DynamoDB exposes a REST API endpoint, multiple different ones actually. So in this example, we're looking at get items, but it exposes REST endpoints for each of these different operations that you're trying to do. So maybe for put item, maybe for update item, maybe for delete item, maybe for queries, all these different things. It has different APIs that it exposes so that you can accomplish these operations. In tandem, there's also a function that is exposed in the AWS DynamoDB SDK, which allows you to easily call that REST endpoint that is living in DynamoDB. Um, so you use the SDK to call a function. That function is going to perform a request on your endpoint that exists in DynamoDB. And then it's gonna return a response back to the user. So I think this is probably the most confusing part. It's the relationship between SDKs and APIs, but this is kind of how it works in real life. You use an SDK and you use functions that are exposed in that SDK to call APIs that can exist on different systems. That's really the crux of it. Uh, so moving on to the summary, I, I hope it's clear now, but just to kind of uh, go through the points really quick. So APIs define how to access a resource. That resource can be, you know, locally, it could be using the Windows SDK to access uh, a resource to create a dialog box or a pop-up window or something like that. Resources can also exist on the cloud, so they can exist on a different server that has information somewhere on the internet where you can access it and retrieve information from. And then SDKs are a tool chain and they can contain tools, including functions, classes, so on and so forth, to call APIs. That's really where the distinction is. So I hope this video cleared up for you the difference between these two things. If you liked it, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks so much, folks, and I'll see you next time.